Hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, fourth session of today's conference. And um, I would uh, like to welcome Fabian, Damian, and Rafael, who will come to the sun names <laughs> before the presentations, uh, for three very interesting papers, uh, or I would say exciting papers, uh, the one on cognitive skills and overconfidence uh, and the role of this to macro phenomena like uh, wealth distribution and uh, uh, marginal purpose to consume. And then the next paper will be dealing with uh, US uh, households understanding and revealed preferences uh, over inflation and monetary policy. And the third one will be on the role of selective memory recalls uh, for inflation expectations. So with uh, no further ado, uh, let's say uh, I would invite the first uh, speaker. It's uh, Fabian Seirich from Berlin School of Economics. And it is uh, a paper co-authored with uh, Oliver Faudenti and uh, Jonathan Zimnan. Sorry if I didn't pronounce the names well. <laughs> Please. OK. Um, then thanks a lot to the organizers for putting together such a nice uh, program and for putting our paper on the program. And I need to start with an apology because we have last minute changed the title because we are right now at the end of a big rewri uh, rewriting session. And the paper is now titled Beyond Bad Luck, Macroeconomic Implications of Persistent Heterogeneity and Optimism and joint work with Oliver Poitney and Jonathan Stinman. So, uh, by now, there is a large consensus that household heterogeneity in their savings behavior and in their financial situations matters greatly both for aggregate fluctuations, but also for the transmission and the effectiveness of monetary and fiscal policy. Think about the Hank literature that makes this point very forceful. What seems to be less well understood so far is the reason why households differ in their savings behavior in the first place. So it remains standard approach, at least in most macro models, um, to assume ex under identical households, which then makes the heterogeneity in financial situations and the saving behavior solely a function of good or bad shocks or of good or bad luck. At the same time, we know that the saving choice of a household should intrinsically be linked to her expectations about the future, in particular to her expectations about her own future financial situations. And this motivates us to ask the question, can we find in the data, can we find belief heterogeneity when it comes to expectations about households' own future financial situation? If so, can it help us understand observed heterogeneity in savings behavior in financial situations? And would it even matter for macroeconomic outcomes and macroeconomic policies? In the paper, we try and answer these questions in the following way. First, we use a new micro data set and show that indeed we can uncover belief heterogeneity when it comes to the expectations about own future financial situations, and we can link these um, we can link this heterogeneity to people's um, behavioral bias. We can then also show that this belief heterogeneity can be linked to observed heterogeneity in savings behavior, and in particular, whether or not households are financially constrained. More optimistic households are more likely to be, fin uh, to be financially constrained. We then build a model to help us understand the macroeconomic implications coming from that. In particular, we take an off-the-shelf one-asset hang model and extend it by a belief heterogeneity along the line we find in the microdata. First, our model can rationalize our empirical findings. Optimistic households, they rather consume than precautionary safe, which makes them more likely to be exposed uh, hand to mouth. But we can then also show that accounting for this belief heterogeneity helps the model to move closer to macro moments that we want to hit with or to, to, to target with our uh, models. Most strikingly, it allows our one asset hang model to match jointly the average marginal propensity to consume and the average wealth level in the economy, which usually one asset hang models fail to do. And Lastly, um, we show that accounting for this belief heterogeneity matters for, uh, for macroeconomic policies, especially to, uh, for fiscal policy. And today I'm going to show you what it implies for the effectiveness of income targeted transfers, um, which are less effective through the lens of our model compared with rational models. And in the paper, we also look to other fiscal policies, which more di directly um, target the income risk of, or insurance of the income risk of households. But today I won't have time to talk about these fiscal policies. 
Let me uh, jump over the literature and directly um, directly jump into the main part of the of the um, of the presentation. Just by the way, the time is not running. Uh, so if you could maybe tell me when I have five minutes left, or oh, I have now more time. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm um, starting with the empirics, but just to guide, to conceptualize what we're after in the empirics, I'm starting with the simplest consumption saving model that you can think of. Think about a household, maybe in partial equilibrium, that um, lives for two periods and tries to maximize her utility over these two periods. In period one, the household wakes up and knows how much income she has, but now she needs to decide how much to save, how much to consume out of this income, and in particular, she faces uncertainty about her future financial situation in uh, period two. Might be due because she don't know her productivity in the future, might be due because she doesn't know aggregate wages in the future. Um, the household has some subjective expectations, as we uh, denote by, by E. Tilde here, about this future, uh, fi future financial situation, which might or might not be rational. We all know that through the Euler equation, her today's consumption and her today's savings are linked towards her expectations about her future financial situation. And what is more, on the standard assumption and all else equal, we should expect the household to um, decrease her savings or have lower savings, the more optimistic the household is about her future. But this leaves us with the question, can we somehow measure optimism in the data? Can we find households that um, have maybe an optimistic bias in the data? Can we detect heterogeneity when it comes to these expectations? The best thing we could do in the first best world or in an ideal world would be to simply elicit her subjective expectation and compare them to the rational expectation the household should have and then compute the difference and say this is the degree of optimism. Unfortunately, rational expectations are not observable, so this approach is not feasible. A more indirect way could be to elicit ex post forecast errors in the sense trying to um, uh, or, or comparing the ex ante expectations about her future finance situation with her true realization ex post. But this is in itself insufficient to de detect ex an ante optimism because we don't know where if there's an optimistic for overly optimistic forecast error, we don't know whether this is due because the uh, household has been ex ante too optimistic or whether she has simply been hit by a bad shock. So even rational households will make overly optimistic forecast error every once in a while once they get unlucky. We instead, um, we instead um, use another approach or suggest another approach which um, to identify uh, belief heterogeneity and ex ante optimism in, in, in households. And our approach requires us to find a variable or if you want an identifier of, of optimism that is correlated with financial situation optimism but unlikely to be caused by financial situation optimism, not driven by the shocks that uh, impact the future financial situation. And ideally, we also want this variable to be conceptually related to overall, to the whole idea of being too optimistic. And we are proposing a variable that is, has been dubbed in the microbehavioral literature as overconfident. Basically, this measures how well calibrated consumers are with respect or how well calibrated their perception about their own abilities are. And the idea is then to use this measure of overconfidence and try and estimate correlation between this overconfident and how, how, uh, how often uh, a, a certain consumer makes overly optimistic forecast errors and how likely it is for this consumer to be hand to mouth. We're doing so using data from the American Life Panel. In particular, we heavily rely on two rounds of this, uh, of this uh, survey. Because in this uh, two rounds, 2014 and 2017, uh, one of our co-authors, Jonathan Thinman, with a former co-author of his, has uh, introduced a behavioral module, if you want, to understand really or to really elicit consumers' overconfidence, their cognitive abilities, and other uh, useful um, variables. And the idea is how to measure overconfidence is really households are asked to do a standard ability test in this, in this model. But before they start with their test, they are also asked how do they think, how well will they perform relative to other participants. We can then use their perceived rank minus their actual rank and um, use this difference as their degree of overconfidence. And then we can rank the consumers according to their degree of overconfidence. And this will be our, our um, our stand-in variable for optimism. 
We can also, in the American Life Panel, we can also construct financial situation forecast errors. Because households are asked in about one year from now, are you expecting to do financially worse, better, or roughly the same? And one year later, the same panelists are asked again, are you doing better, worse, or the same than one year ago? And what is nice, we can pull in from more rounds this, uh, these observations, because the same panelists that have uh, were taking part in these two behavioral rounds, they have also been taking part potentially in other rounds, so we have a little bit more of observations here. We have then also an, a measure of hand to mouth status. In particular, we use a measure in which households are asked whether they are under severe financial distress. And in both rounds, around 30% of households are under severe financial distress, so it's in the same ballpark as other hand to mouth measures. We can then also throw in a bunch of controls, typical controls, demographic controls like gender, education, financial controls like income and wealth, but we can also account for uh, behavioral controls, something like behavioral common factors, also um, derived by the micro behavioral literature, or we can also use cognitive abilities and so on as, as financial uh, as controls in our regressions. What are our key findings? Well, the most important finding that we have is that Indeed, overconfidence is both statistically but also economically significantly correlated with how likely it is for a household to do an overly optimistic forecast errors. In particular, being too standard deviation more overconfident is associated with an increase in the proportion of doing overly optimistic forecast errors by around 10 to 16 percentage point. And the range comes from different regressions that we run with different subset of, of control. But we also see that overconfidence is statistically and economically significantly correlated with the likelihood of being hand to mouth. So two standard deviation, higher degree of overconfidence is associated with an 11 to 16 percentage point higher likelihood of being hand to mouth. So we find that there's belief heterogeneity. This belief heterogeneity is linked to overconfidence and it seems to, um, or it can be linked to observed heterogeneity in households financial situations. Interestingly, we don't find any meaningful correlation between um, hand to mouth status on the one side and other potential explanators for why households differ in their savings behavior. For example, we don't find any clear correlation between hand to mouth status and the patient of a household and not between hand to mouth status and the risk aversion of a household. But how we, can we make sense now of our empirical findings from a macro perspective? For that, we need a model, and the idea is to take an off-the-shelf standard one-asset hang model and just, uh, just tweak it a little bit by introducing belief heterogeneity along the line we find in the data. As typically in these models, households face idiosyncratic income risk and incomplete markets, so they can only self-insure their risk by accumulating assets. What's different from the standard model is that households are ex ante uh, heterogeneous in the sense that they belong to one of the three groups. 50% of households are rational, 25% of households are mild optimist, 25% of households are strong optimist. And the differences across groups is now only in how households form expectation about the future financial situation. Rational households have rational expectations, but optimistic households have an optimistic bias in their expectations about the future financial situation. In our baseline, this bias is rooted or comes from that households on average overestimate their future uh, idiosyncratic productivity. But in principle, we could also model it in the sense that households are too optimistic with respect to aggregates or they neglect some expenses that they have in the future and uh, are too um, neglect them more than, than other households. We then calibrate the belief difference uh, or the group difference such that it matches the belief difference that we find in the micro data. In particular, the increase in the likelihood of doing an overly optimistic forecast error from a rational household to the op mild optimist and then to the uh, strong optimistic households. And the rest of the calibration uses a standard uh, hang calibration. This household site is then put into general equilibrium with the standard, even a textbook, uh, New Keynesian uh, firm site and standard assumption about monetary and fiscal policy. And instead of showing you the, the details of the model uh, through equations, let me try to bring across the intuition of the model with two graphs. The first graph I'm, I'm showing you here is the savings policy function along the wealth distribution for households that are in the medium income state. I just picked one income state. It doesn't matter that it's the medium income state. I could have picked any other income state. And the first thing to take away here is that there is savings hydrogen or heterogeneity in the savings behavior for observationally equivalent household, meaning for households that have the same income and the same wealth. 
as in the two-period model, the more optimistic a household is, the less she's, she's going to save. But this implies an ex post that optimistic households have a lower buffer stock, a too low buffer stock from a rational perspective. And therefore, given that they are hit by the same shock or the same likely to be hit by shocks, they are ex post uh, more likely to become hand to mouse. But there's also heterogeneity uh, for observer nationally equivalent household when it comes to the marginal propensity uh, to consume. And this is particularly nice because it has been found by recent empirical papers. For example, Lewis and all show that there are a large heterogeneity for observer nationally equivalent households in the marginal propensity to consume, and our model can um, kind of replicate this. But this changed behavior of households in, um, in, in the model also has, uh, it helps the model to better, um, uh, to better fit key macro moments that we want our models to fit, in particular um, when it comes to the hand-to-mouse share and the average marginal propensity to consume. Our model predicts a hand-to-mouse share of 23% and an average marginal propensity to consume of 19%. If you compare it this with uh, the rational version of the model, the same model but in which there's no group difference, in which all households have the same rational expectations, you see that this model um, drastically fails in having a high average marginal propensity to consume. The empirical estimates are somewhere between 15 and 25 percent. This is well known in the literature, given once you, uh, once you um, calibrate these one asset hand models to match uh, total wealth in the economy, the average marginal propensity to consume are too low. And the reason is that rational households, they really, are, they really want to save themselves away from the borrowing constraint, given that there is enough wealth in this economy, most households are successful, and therefore most households have low marginal propensity to consume. In our model, this is not the case. As I already said, a lot of households save too little from a rational perspective, so they are very likely to be ex post hand to mouse. But even if they are not hand to mouse, um, the optimistic households have a higher marginal propensity to consume than the rational households, both pushes up the average marginal propensity to consume. We also match better other uh, wealth data, but let me not talk about it. But let me rather lose, uh, use the last three minutes to talk about the implications for fiscal policy in particular to the specific fiscal policy that has been used in recent recessions quite, um, quite often, which is paying out transfers and paying out transfers in a targeted way, um, targeting low-income households. We model this in a very simple way. We simply assume that there's a transfer going to the uh, bottom 25% of the income distribution. Um, we allow to be some, that there's some persistency in this transfer payments, and we assume that in total, the impact payment of these transfers uh, accumulate to 1% of, uh, of GDP, because then we can easily convert it into impact multipliers. We um, <coughs> compare what such a transfer would do across three different models. Our baseline model with belief heterogeneity, the rational model with the low average marginal propensity to consume that I just talked about, but given that it has such low average marginal propensity to consume, we also compare it to a rational model in which we reduce wealth such that this average marginal propensity to consume is the same as in our model. What you can see here is now what these three models predict that such a, uh, such a transfer does to aggregate output. And, and basically you see that these three models, they differ quite drastically in what they predict how this uh, policy would, um, would transmit to aggregate output. Non-surprisingly, the model, the rational model with low average marginal propensity to consume um, has the lowest uh, impact or predicts the lowest impact on output because in this model almost most households have low, uh, low marginal propensity to consume. But if you look at a rational model, which has the same er uh, marginal propensity to consume on average than our model, this model would really predict these transfers to be super effective, even a golden bullet. So you can really translate this almost 3% increasing output to an impact multiplier, impact transfer multiplier of close to three, which is really a uh, huge. Our model on the other side predicts an uh, impact multiplier of close to one, but below one. So predicts this uh, policy to be effective, but not as effective as the rational model is. What is the difference between the two models? Well, while they have the same average marginal propensity to consume, what's really key for such targeted policies is the distribution of marginal propensities to consume. And both models predict a totally different uh, average marginal propensity to consume of the transfer recipients, which are the low-income households. Our model, given that the key prediction of having high marginal propensity to consume is whether or not households are optimistic, has a rather flat marginal propensity to consume to income distribution, which is also in line with recent empirical findings. For example, the uh, Böhm et al. paper recently showed that it's while lowest income households have high marginal propensity to consume, 
much of propensity consume basically stay high along the whole income distribution. And our model kind of can replicate this. The rational model on the other side can't because it can only get a high average marginal propensity consume if it counterfactually assume that all low households, uh, low income households have high marginal propensity to consume. So if you account for this flatter marginal propensity to consume to income distribution, it's more tough for fiscal policy to exploit differences in marginal propensity to consume. It's tougher to find the households who to target who really have the high marginal propensity to consume. There's a second channel at work, but um, let me not talk about this, but let me rather conclude because my time is about to run out. So what we do in the paper is we sh first show in microdata that there is belief heterogeneity in particular, that there is some households that have are too optimistic when it comes to their um, comes to their own uh, expect expecting their own future financial situation, and we can link those households to being more likely to be hand to mouth to be financially constrained. Putting this then in a macro model shows that or suggests that the reason for why households differ in their savings behavior can actually matter quite a lot, both for macroeconomic outcomes, but also for macroeconomic policies. Thanks a lot for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Fabian. Thank you for keeping in time, almost, uh, <laughs> not, notwithstanding that we didn't have the time. Uh, so perhaps we can open the floor, please. Hi, uh, thanks, very interesting. So um, you talked about optimists and rational people, so I'm wondering why don't you talk also about pessimists or what are the shares of these three groups in your sample? And then also I found the concept of, or the view on optimism a bit, um, let's say, pessimistic, right? I think there's a literature in psychology showing that people who are optimistic are actually more successful in, in life. And, um, and for instance, there's this literature on entrepreneurship which shows that it's never ex ante individually rational to be an entrepreneur, but it's actually very important for society. Maybe the same applies to, to academics and other uh, pro professions. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering how you think about that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Thanks, uh, Tarun Ramadurai Imperial. Um, I'm just a, a, a bit confused because um, uh, overconfidence is about the second moment. <coughs> it's about how tight your prior is about something. Um, optimism is about the first moment. Uh, there's no necessary connection between those two things. I can be overconfidently pessimistic but you sort of seem to be conflating the two things, so I'd rather you some discussion on that. Thank you. Oh, please, back. So you mentioned really briefly at the beginning um, this link between optimism and uh, risk and uh, patience, so risk preference and patience. And I was just wondering whether you could say a little bit more about what you find in terms of your data then, whether you're also planning on, on looking at this angle in your model. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, Chung Yang from Federal Reserve. Uh, I have a question like, how persistent is this heterogeneity and optimism in the data? So you assume that it's kind of permanent, permanent extent heterogeneity you assume in the, in the model, but I wonder whether this pass optimism or pessimism, uh, how persistent, or whether it's kind of uh, different across different uh, business cycles or something like that, so. Thank you. And um, if I may add one question. Uh, by the way, my name is Janis Garnoulis from the ECB. <laughs> um, so, um, a bit uh, relates to the last question. You seem to be uh, suggesting that uh, uh, optimism is a trait-like characteristic, so it's stable to people. Of course, perhaps the psychology literature that was mentioned uh, possibly um, shows a, a reverse causality. You did well in certain areas, uh, expectations, and so on, and you tend to become overconfident. I wasn't sure whether it makes any difference to your narrative, but perhaps you can see through it 
more easily than me. Thank you. I don't think I have any anybody from online either, so perhaps if there are no other questions, please. Okay, thanks a lot for all these questions. All very good questions and all um, <laughs> tough to answer. And let me start with the last questions because I think the two last questions they are kind of can be grouped together. It's about the persistence in the behavioral bias, right? And so uh, what our results show um, in the two rounds is that who has ever has been overconfident in the first round, 95% of the people are overconfident in the second round. It means at least along these three years, households seem to be stably overconfident. There's other microbehavioral literature that shows that mostly these behavioral traits, they are kind of very persistent, if not permanent. So I think here the question is really how persistent is persistent enough such that we can uh, model this at permanent. And I agree we should run an, a robustness check in which we model it as not permanent, but very persistent. And then we should have a similar results. But this is, of course, a very good question. We would need a much longer panel to really dig, dig from our empirical sites much deeper into that. But I think we can, it's fair to say that it's at least very persistent, the trait of, of being um, optimistic or overly uh, overconfident. And you're right, um, in, the, in, the, in the psychology literature, it's sometimes uh, treated as trait-like, being too optimistic. But I'm not an expert on the psychology literature, so maybe we should, uh, should have uh, another closer look and or try to pull in more data such that we can run it in our uh, survey and really see that it is like not only very persistent, but very, very persistent. But that's something um, we should, we could um, do more work in that uh, regard. Then there was a question about optimism and risk and, and patience. So the point um, to make here is that if you look at the Euler equation, patience, for example, could also be a very well theoretical explanator for why households save one or two households save less, uh, two twins, the one is more patient and the other save less or, or, or more. And the interesting thing is what we do is that we don't find any correlation um, with hand to mouth status. So at least in our data sets, patience seems not to be an explanator, at least empirically, for households um, becoming hand to mouth. And we find, found this quite interesting because, for example, there's also papers out there that model it with, with uh, difference in patients. And our data does not uh, suggest this story. And that's, that's what we, we find quite uh, interesting. Um, then there was a question about overconfidence, which is rather a second moment and using it as a proxy for a first moment, let's say. Um, so from my understanding here, the microbehavioral literature is a little bit different from our confidence in macro perspective oftentimes is how much do you trust your signals, right? But this is not the story that we have in mind. Here is just like how households perceive their abilities and how well they think like and um, to perceive the, the person Abilities and in particular, it is about overconfident gives a direction of a bias. Maybe you could uh, could add up if you. Yeah, that's not quite right. Yeah. The way they measure No, but but here, the more overconfident you are, the more you overestimate your abilities. That's what we measure with overconfidence. Relative relative to the rest of the distribution, yes. But it also gives you the direction in which, in which it goes. You overestimate your own abilities. That's, that's how I would, would. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Point taken, yeah. And, and the first one was um, about, we only talk about optimists, what about the pessimists? And so I think like at the back of this question is like, what's the rational benchmark? And we cannot really find a rational benchmark, but what you know on aggregate, on average, there's much more optimistic forecast errors than there are pessimistic forecast errors. So it seems like the whole populated, uh, population is shifted towards being too optimistic rather than being um, too pessimistic. We do an, an exercise or an, an robustness check where we introduce pessimists into our, uh, our uh, analysis. In particular, um, we have we have 11% of our, our households, for example, are underconfident with regard to their abilities, and we use this as a share for pessimistic household. If we do that in our exercise, um, quantitatively stuff changes a little bit, but only a little bit, so qualitatively our results go, go through. Um, but yeah, that's, I think, the question there. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Fabian. Thanks for 
keeping the time. So um, then we can move to the second uh, paper. Uh, Damian Pfeiffer will be presenting. The paper is uh, co-written with uh, uh, Fabian Winkler. And I believe both from FED. Well, I'm, <coughs> I'm in the Cleveland FED now, no, and Fabian okay. is in the board. Okay. So <laughs> there, is, there, there is a slight change. Okay. In that. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, preference over inflation and monetary policy trade-offs. Um, standard disclaimer applies, since we are still both affiliated with the Federal Reserve System. Um, so what do we do here? So the Congress has mandated uh, the Federal Reserve to promote uh, maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate interest rates. Um, and, but they didn't define what actual objectives are. What is the objective for the price uh, stability? What is the objective uh, about the uh, uh, maximum employment and, and, and so on? It also, um, they didn't, you know, um, they didn't give us an exact um, way how we should trade off this objective when they're in conflict. So um, what, do, what, the, what did the central banks do so far? So mostly we relied on macroeconomic models in order to answer these questions. However, um, these, those macroeconomic models, mostly built on New Keynesian transition, uh, tradition, they rely on several assumptions. You know, the slope of Phillips curve matters. The form of preferences that you assume for the households matter. The degree of monopolistic competition in the, in, uh, in the economy matter. So in this paper, we do a slightly different approach. Uh, we ask the households what their preferences are over stabilizing uh, inflation, unemployment, uh, and unemployment. And, um, and how do they weight these two objectives? And we ask them about their goals. What do they think the, 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 the optimal inflation rate for, for the American um, economy is? So how do we do that? Um, you know, we put together a survey uh, with, uh, with two questions. Uh, with, with, um, it, we had two ways of the survey, uh, which has questions about attention. Uh, that uh, households pay to the macroeconomic information and to the to information about the Federal Reserve. And then we asked them about their views on inflation, what is their view, that's, uh, that's what the target of the Federal Reserve is, and then what they think that the optimal inflation uh, rate for the American economy would be. And then in the last part of the survey, we go one step further, and we sort of ask questions about um, relative preferences over inflation, unemployment, and interest rates. And um, you know, then we use this question in order to answer you know, several questions that we have uh, about uh, their preferences for, for um, uh, regarding the trade-off between stabilizing unemployment and stabilizing uh, inflation. So we start that by just studying the determinants of attention to monetary policy rate and to inflation. And we look at which are the households that are attentive to the news about uh, monetary policy and then and the news about the Federal Reserve. And then we go on to estimate um, uh, uh, the determinants of this perceived and optimal uh, inflation targets. And then we move on to, to study the, the trade-off between these, um, uh, these preferences. And one thing that we found initially when we had questions with, with uh, preferences over inflation, unemployment, and interest rates is that really um, Households don't put interest rates in the, into, the same, into the same bucket when they think about uh, economy. And basically, the preferences um, over interest rates satisfy the uh, independent, independence axiom here. But they do have um, you know, in mind trade-offs between uh, inflation and unemployment. And they, they, do to some, they do understand that there exists a trade-off. And we'll see that you know, when we go on and estimate first the sacrifice ratio, we estimate specific sacrifice ratio, which is the acceptable sacrifice ratio. And that is, I want to define it, and that's the amount of un unemployment that households are just willing to tolerate in order to reduce inflation by one percentage point. Okay? This is different than the necessary sacrifice ratio that is usually estimated in the models where you know, we, uh, we, well, the necessary sacrifice ratio is heavily dependent on, for example, the assumption of, uh, of the slope of the Phillips curve. And then once we establish this, this uh, sacrifice ratio, we sort of show that this is, is nonlinear. Uh, 
relationship. Um, you know, when unemployment is high, they're willing to tolerate less increase of an unemployment to, to bring down inflation by one percentage point compared to the case where unemployment starts from a very low point. And so we, de we then go on and then we write down a form of, um, of uh, utility function or approximation to that utility function as Woodward showed us um, and try to uh, estimate a form of loss function that uh, is usually derived from household preferences and we try to see uh, various parameters there. We try to see the concavity um, of, of these um, uh, indifference curves, as, as, I will, uh, as I will call them later on, and the relative weight that one attaches to stabilizing employment versus stabilizing, uh, versus stabilizing inflation. And as we know in macroeconomic models, this weight on stabilizing employment is usually very small because it depends on uh, the slope of the Phillips curve and the degree of uh, competition in the economy. But as we will see, what our results will show that actually households have a relatively high weight, even higher than, than the, the weight on inflation. So they value uh, unemployment uh, stabilization as, um, as, as, as costly, basically. Okay, and I, you know, um, what we find is if we go from the start is that, you know, quite a lot of households are actually quite attentive uh, to, to monetary policy, at least uh, it was during our sample, which uh, we conducted the first wave uh, in June 2023, and then we follow up with the second wave in June 2024. And uh, the median households perceive that the Fed is pursuing an inflation target five years, five years out, that is about 3%. And they think that optimal inflation would be considerably lower, around 1%. And quite a few actually perceive that uh, deflation might be optimal, uh, which we can talk about a little bit later. And then we see that you know, the average preferences over inflation and um, unemployment stabilization is quite well represented by the nonlinear loss function. Uh, but the weight on inflation is much lower compared to what the models we su would suggest. And um, also, you know, as we will see, these preferences exhibit quite sizable degree of heterogeneity across demographic groups or across uh, numeracy or um, a bunch of other things that we can control for uh, in these regressions. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, we have two waves of this survey. Uh, we very recently got the data for the second wave that was conducted in June 2024. Uh, it was conducted as a special module for the survey of consumer expectation that is uh, run by our colleagues at the New York Feds. And thank you again for including us uh, into these uh, surveys. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, so New York Feds occasionally conducts these special surveys on the household that actually rotated out of the regular panel. So all the, the data that I will present is from household that at some point they participated in the survey uh, of consumer expectations for the regular 12 rounds. Then they were out for a number of years. I think the average is about two and a half years, but some of them were out for like seven or eight years. And then they, they were asked, oh, do you want to do this special panel? And then um, they answered uh, the question in this special panel. And there are you know, regular questions about inflation expectations, various um, other you know, special questions that they, they were administrated, plus then there were uh, these our questions. Uh, we had about 2,000 responses in 2023, where we have a full module, and then we ask a subset of questions that we ask in 2023, also in 2024. Um, and we have about 1,000 respondents uh, there. Okay, so just to give you an idea at the beginning, you know, we asked them about attention to, about, uh, to various news in the economy, to various interest rates in the economies, to news about inflation, news about macroeconomy, news about Federal Reserve. And just to give you a snippet of that is we see that um, and quite a lot of um, you know, households were uh, quite attentive even to federal funds rate, which was a little bit uh, uh, unexpected. And we can also find that uh, more than half of the households um, you know, monitor federal funds rates uh, at least at quarterly level. And as we see, the news about Federal Reserve is, it is half of the households receive news about Federal Reserve at least at a monthly uh, frequency. Some of them 
they claim that uh, they hear news about Tidal Reserve at daily frequency as well. Um, so, I mean, we can look at the determinants. We see that, you know, some of the standard relationship applies. For example, um, households with, uh, with, uh, with um, uh, male respondents or the male head of households, um, um, you know, have higher attention to this news, both to news about the Federal Fund threat and to news uh, uh, about the Federal Reserve. And we see, for example, that uh, both of these are uh, positively correlated with both education and income. It, we have a ham shape response for age, for example, as well. In, and um, uh, yeah. So let me just give you a little bit about situation at times. So how they perceive a macroeconomic situation. We see that in both June 2023 and June 2024, about two thirds of households, or even more than two thirds of households, were, were quite concerned uh, with inflation, right? So there is a high, and it didn't really change that much between 2023 and 2024. So that was something that was a little bit surprising for us. And then we asked them about uh, basically the, um, whether they're concerned with, with the risk of becoming unemployed uh, for them and their family. And we actually see that most of them disagree. But we see sort of a shift between 2023 and 2024 that in 2024 more and more households become concerned with this risk compared to, uh, compared to 2023. Okay, so then we asked them about two questions um, uh, regarding inflation. And first we asked them, uh, what is the annual rate of inflation that the Federal Reserve is trying to achieve five years, five years out? And we can actually see that um, about 35% of the respondents say exactly 2%, but then there are a significant share of people who, uh, who say higher than 2%. And actually, the median value is, is, is 3% there. And so uh, that potentially signals that there is some room in com better communication regarding the, uh, the targets. Um, and then as a follow-up question, so after a few questions, we also asked them that what is the rate of inflation that would be best for the American uh, economy, also in, um, you know, uh, further out. And we actually see that those numbers are significantly different than the numbers about uh, what uh, the Federal Reserve is trying to achieve. And in fact, the, med uh, the median value there uh, is, is about 1%. Okay, and with a significant share of almost 30% of households reporting that uh, deflation might be optimal for the, for the American economy. So if we go on and trying to see um, the determinants of that, uh, we see that uh, uh, they're positively correlated, uh, perceived and that you know, perceived target is positively correlated with the, with the optimal target. And also we see that those households that believe that deflation is optimal would actually have higher perceived targets, okay? And uh, we see that there is some correlation with other, uh, what other demographic characteristics. For example, if you own a home, you tend to have both higher perceived target and higher uh, optimal target. And that could be associated with the fact that, you know, most homeowners have a mortgage, and if you have a mortgage with a fi fixed interest rates, you do want to have some inflation. We also see, like, uh, for example, as I saw, show before, is that the female participants have a higher perceived target and lower optimal target. And this is especially then visible when we try to find the determinants of the, of the difference between the perceived and opt optimal target. And also interesting that, uh, you know, this perceived and uh, optimal target is also an important determinant of both short-run inflation expectations. And in the first way, we also can check for long-run inflation expectations five years out. And then, for example, the coefficient on optimal target uh, would be close to 0 0.9. So it's very, you know, long-run inflation expectations seems to be quite correlated with, this, with uh, your um, definition of what optimal inflation is uh, for the American economy. Okay, and then we go on to questions regarding the, uh, the trade-off between uh, unemployment, inflation, and interest rates. And I will not spend too much time on this first question that tries to elicit the trade-off between all these three different uh, objectives. Uh, the only thing that, that, I, that I will say is that, you know, in, uh, this question was only asked in the first survey, uh, that, you know, there was um, 
that's, yeah, people, what you can get out of this is that people do perceive that there is a trade-off between inflation and unemployment, but really they don't think that's, that's, um, that's um, you know, interest rates come into picture uh, with this trade-off. You know, they really think um, as um, preferences over uh, interest rates are sort of independent. And there, you know, if I can talk a for a second about preferences for interest rate, they do prefer lower interest rate, although they do understand that inflation has to come down, okay? So let's go a little bit now, focus in the last five minutes uh, on this uh, quantifying the trade-off between unemployment and inflation. So we have, a, uh, we have uh, hypothetical scenarios. We utilize hypo hypothetical scenarios to, to um, elicit uh, this, uh, this uh, acceptable uh, sacrifice ratio, or perceived trade-off between these goals. And we give them uh, a number of, you know, we give them uh, two scenarios at the beginning and uh, where the rate of inflation is, for example, 4%, but the unemployment rate is 10%. And then this scenario B, the rate of inflation is 8%, but the unemployment rate is 7%. And then we ask them which of these two they would prefer. And they answer, oh, I would prefer, for example, scenario A. And then we have a follow-up question where we modify one of these numbers and we ask them, so in order for scenario B, so in order that you will be indifferent between scenario B and A, what rate of uh, unemployment uh, you would have to have, for example, in scenario B, okay? And then they give us that. And using that, um, or in, in particular, you know, uh, the rate of unemployment in scenario A here. And using that, we get sort of this, this indifference point or point on their, uh, on their indifference curve. And from that on, you know, we can, we can compute this acceptable sacrifice ratio in the first stage as, you know, how much unemployment they're willing to sacrifice uh, uh, in order to bring down inflation for one percentage point. And here are the answers. So on average, it's about 0 0.6, okay? So what House could perceive is that they would be willing to tolerate, just tolerate, an increase of unemployment by 0 0.6 percentage point in order to bring down inflation by one percentage point. And if you look at the determinants of that, we see that, for example, um, that this is state dependent, and I'll focus that on the next slide. And then, you know, it's, it's, uh, the sacrifice ratio uh, is slightly higher for those with high numeracy and, and high education, and it's lower for female participants and for black Americans and for Latino Americans. So that means that, for example, black Americans and la Latino Americans, they value unemployment a little bit more relative to stabilizing inflation, okay? And now let's, let's dwell into the state dependence. So let's look at how the sacrifice ratio, this I'm plotting, by the way, the kernel, uh, you know, um, uh, densities uh, for, for all the answers. So if you look at an acceptable increase in the unemployment rate, when we start from the initial level of 7%, and you can see this is the green line, we see that it's much lower compared to when we start from initial level of 3%. So that means that if you started, if you, if, if you currently have 3% unemployment rate, then you're willing to tolerate higher increase in unemployment rate in order to bring down inflation by one percentage point than when you start from initial point of 7%. And similarly, you know, the results are very similar for inflation. Uh, you know, so this points that there is some non-linearity non there, okay? So now what we do in, uh, next is we try to estimate uh, these preference relations. And we take, you know, like uh, a loss function that is common in, in, in the new Keynesian literature, and we try to estimate this using the nonlinear least squares, okay? So what we get is we do a bunch of different specifications where we fix some parameters and where we estimate some parameters. And sometimes we set the optimal inflation target to the level that, that uh, they actually provide it, and sometimes we try to estimate it. But what we get here is, you know, pretty reasonable values for pi star and for, for u star, uh, as you can see. So the results are that lambda, this is the relative preference of inflation and unemployment, is much higher than what new Keynesian models would suggest us under standard calibration, which is around 0 0.01 or something like that, of that order. Here, the order is two or three. That means much higher weight on, on unemployment uh, stabilization than in, in the models. 
Also, the concavity, so th this, uh, we usually we have the quadratic preferences, right, when we do the approximation of the utility function. So when we estimate this row value, it is, it is not linear, it is, it is uh, significantly different from being linear, but it's not quite there at all, it's, it's lower, okay? So what this implies, implies that when we estimate it, you get in different curves that look like that, right? So it's a little bit more boxy. Uh, than, than this case when you have quadratic. So this is, for example, estimation from column two, and these are estimations from column five. So these are in different curves. Of course, closer you are to the origin, you're a higher level of utility, but at any point on, on these on this, on this lines, you're at, uh, you're, you're at the same utility. I'm running late, so the only thing is that we put this into, uh, and this is the last slide, into, um, you know, into standard New Keynesian model, and we try to look what the implications would it be for the, for, uh, for the variability of inflation and unemployment if we, uh, if we have uh, preferences that are more closer to the ones that, that we specify. And uh, the result really depends on, on the slope of the Phillips curve that we assume. If the Phillips slope is, is very little, then you don't have to give up much of an increase into, into variability of inflation in order to, to, to reduce hundredfold the variability of unemployment, okay? But when, like in the last column here, when the Phillips curve uh, is higher, there is a more uh, of a trade-off there, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, so please. To what extent do you worry about the possibility that these people who have left the standard panel after taking part in this survey that asks all their, you know, all these questions about expectations, etc., there is a kind of learning effect after 12 months. And probably one way to check this is um, you can run a regression controlling on the right-hand side on the time elapsed since the time they left the survey uh, and see if this significantly correlates um, so the longer they are out of the survey, presumably, the, the less they know about policy rates. And my other comment is, can you get a bit more of um, uh, internal validity using info in the survey uh, about these trade-offs, which I find very interesting? So for example, if you look at retired, retired should have a very high uh, sacrificing ratio potentially because they shouldn't care much about unemployment, but they, of course they, they care big time about uh, inflation. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yeah, I was wondering if you can actually like um, um, interact with your result with actually the, the location where they are, for example, the history of inflation they have, and also the past. I guess you can, you can see where they were in the past and where they are now. I wonder if, for example, those of the racial gap that you find might be explained because of their history of unemployment or maybe the history of unemployment of the region where they are located. Uh, I, I think that would be very interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. I think this is very interesting. Yuri Gorodnichenko. Um, <clears throat> one fact which uh, strikes me as somewhat suspicious um, is that so many people follow the Fed funds rate at the daily frequency, like 10% of people. I'm not sure I'm following Fed funds rate daily. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, you know, if it's just a set of options that you present to people and then they pick something from this menu or if it's an open-ended question and they enter information by themselves. And also one, one more question here. Uh, <clears throat> You, you, you have two waves in 2023 and 2024. Uh, my understanding that in, in, uh, in, uh, in the data which is similar to yours, when people are asked about what rate of inflation they would like to see, it is not unusual to see that people want to have really big deflations, minus 5%, minus 10%. Um, maybe it's somewhere in your slides and I missed it, I apologize. But you know, I was wondering if you can see time variation in the preferred rates of um, inflation that people have. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please, back. Thanks. 
Um, I was just wondering, I mean, uh, you had those two waves and I think it's great that you already cover the high inflation period and then sort of the more deflationary period of when inflation was uh, reduced. But um, potentially going forward, I think it would be really interesting to also have another wave in a period when inflation is stable and maybe there's more unemployment risk just to check how much the current environment is driving your estimates. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, just, just a small question from my side. I suppose an uh, unobservable characteristic is uh, political affiliation, particularly this year. Um, would that make any difference? I mean, it, I can imagine it crosses with some of the characteristics that you uh, identified, but you know, perhaps you can say something about that. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Quick follow up on that. I'm very intrigued by the results. When when I saw the question wording, where I think you asked like to your family, like right? It's really about unemployment how much people care but it's phrased as for your family so and i was i was expecting some people with very unlikely to be unemployed uh you know like uh, or people who are already retired you know that they their weight would be very different but it it looks like it's really capturing altruism and what people really care about for the country and so yeah i, I totally agree about political affiliation and maybe other measures of altruism that are in the survey uh, that you can look at to see whether, you know, it really kind of captured that as well. Okay, um, let me try to answer uh, at least some of the comments. Uh, if I start from the back, uh, from, the, from Wilbert, um, yeah, it's praise for your family, and that was sort of a deliberate, um, deliberate choice because utility function uh, in, the, in the models is about your utility function, not about the economy's utility function. So that's sort of the reason why we, do th we did that. We deviate that for optimal inflation because we do know that it's important to ask for American economy because otherwise people tend to, to, uh, to think too much about uh, uh, diminishing value of their uh, income and how much less goods th they, they value. And there is very few reasons why they would answer positive otherwise. Um, yeah, I completely agree regarding political affiliation. Um, I think this is an interesting question and I believe that you do have some political affiliation in the New York um, SCE. So I could try to link the, the data and, and put it in, especially around election time. We know that there are big shifts in uh, preferences, optimism, sentiments, when your uh, preferred candidate gets elected or does not get elected. So we know that from the literature. So it, it might affect also preferences and perceptions what uh, uh, any government institution is doing. Um, uh, Lena's question regarding disinflation. Uh, and yeah, um, generally, uh, it would be great to have a, a more waves of survey, so uh, it is also costly to have more waves, so we'll have to see uh, whether it's possible to get that. But um, actually, I will reiterate our paper. Preferences tend to be very stable for a given level of inflation expectations <laughs> to advertise it, so I do not expect that, the, the, that, uh, that uh, preferences for the a monetary policy or trade-off between inflation and monetary policy would be too state dependent. They could be, you know, to some degree, but uh, but I would not be, um, uh, my prior would be not that they are not too sensitive. Um, if we go to, to Yuri's question, um, so yeah, they, they have options, you know, they, they, have a, they have a menu of options, either they follow daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, not at all, or I don't know what this is. So these are the, these are basically the option and they pick. So why we, one of the reasons why we put that question in is as well because we wanted to ask questions about interest rate expectations. And we were sort of worried to ask about federal funds rate expectations because we didn't know whether they, they, they know or they don't know about federal funds rate expectations. So we did that 
in 2023, and we actually found, then we, you know, basically this uh, news question was a selection question of for which interest rate expectation we will ask you then in the second stage. And we asked a number of people for federal funds rate expectations, and um, in June 2023, they believe that one year out, federal funds rate will be at 5.3% on average, and they were 5.3% on average. <laughs> The variance was much higher than, for example, professional forecasters, but um, I was presently surprised by that. 2023-2024, um, we only recently got the data for 2024, so we didn't explore all the options, so um, I will defer you for the new version of the paper, uh, which should come out you know, in the next few weeks, um, and we will focus on that. Uh, on that a bit more carefully. It did seem that in 2024, there are more people who think that deflation is optimal than they were in 2023. I can already tell you that. Um, Mathieu, uh, location, we have that. We haven't looked at that uh, carefully. So, um, um, uh, yeah, we can, we can look at history more. And Dimitris, um, we also haven't done that. We just explored how often, uh, how, how long they are out. And we did only that so far for the 2023 wave, but we'll do it for 2024 and we will interact with that. You know, it's sort of, we know that when you're every month in the panel, you learn about things. We don't know what happened when you're out of the panel for seven years sometimes, whether you still remember some of these things that you learned or not. So that's, you know, sort of a good uh, thing to do. And I'm a little bit over, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, in order to ask them the thing, the next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Rafael Schoenle. I should be uh, uh, careful with my affiliations here. <laughs> I got it the wrong ones. <laughs> so, uh, the paper is uh, written together with uh, Nicola Genaioli, Marta Leva, and Andrei Schleifer. So, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, thank you very much for um, putting this paper on the program. Um, so you already named my co-authors. Uh, and uh, what motivates us sort of in this paper is this question, how, how do we form inflation expectations very, very generally? And a conventional belief is really inflations tend to be sticky, uh, expectations tend to be sticky and they depend on some kind of time discounted, possibly slow moving average of your whole lifetime inflation experiences. There could be some costs of processing information lead to inattention and rigidity in, in updating beliefs. Um, there's a whole literature that shows, you know, the complexities of belief formation. Um, you know, the socio-demographic characteristics play a big role. Our mental models, we heard about some social networks possibly communicating information beliefs. Um, there's certainly a role also for recent salient prices or price changes of groceries and gasoline. Um, you know, the, the list can go on and, and there's a lot not to name here. I think the contribution uh, this paper is making really is a sort of twofold. So one is uh, we um, take a model of memory and selective recall uh, by, by my, my co-authors and put that in the inflation expectations context. And then second, we show some evidence for a new state dependent element in inflation expectations formation, which we theoretically micro found in, 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 in on, on the basis of, of this model and cognitive psychology. Um, which, and essentially, you know, you can think that expectations are rigid when inflation is anchored, but uh, it may become sharp, uh, um, sharply unstable during uh, changes in inflation. Um, and uh, I think the, there are some implications for how we measure uh, inflation expectations and also for thinking about the interaction between policy and inflation expectations. Um, motivation for thinking about a state dependent element in, in inflation expectations is summarized by, the, by this figure. So the left panel shows you inflation expectations from the New York Fed survey um, for different cohorts and the, the lower line is the expectations of sort of what the New York Fed defines as the younger cohort under 40. Uh, while the right hand panel shows you the actual experienced inflation rates, it's data from Xavier uh, Jaravel, and there the um, uh, red line, which is on the 
to the right of this dashed line, uh, the lower one shows you um, the older cohorts. Um, and what you see is there is obviously, we all know this, right, a, a rapid belief updating during the recent inflation surge. But it tends to be uh, more rapid for, for older cohorts. And this is somewhat puzzling because, uh, you know, new data ha should have less of an impact on, on a very long database that the older cohort has. Uh, and also, the older cohorts, as this right panel shows, actually experience less current inflation. And this is partly due because they had less gasoline consumption and, and so on. Um, so um, a theory of selective recall uh, can partly, I think, account for this uh, um, uh, updating that ha happens very sharply. Um, so the model I'm, I'm going to show you builds on regularities of selective recall from, from the cognitive sciences. Uh, and there, the, you know, people run usually experiments to understand um, how we uh, recall what we have studied or, or seen at some point. And in, in lab experiments, for example, you can do this by giving people a set of words like tape, mole, dad, and so on. And then you do something else, and then you ask them to recall what they heard, and then they give you things like ring, girl, dad. Uh, so three particular um, uh, uh, features uh, of, or um, elements, namely primacy, recency, and similarity, can account for sort of the, the recall that, that, uh, that uh, people have observed in, in the lab. And this is summarized in this figure. So the left figure shows you the probability of, of, uh, of recall depending on when you were, uh, saw something, so this, the position, um, and you know, it goes from the beginning, which is the left, number one, and to the end of the experiment, and then the right figure shows you the similarity, the, the probability of recall as a function of the similarity of what you saw with a particular cue. And basically the, the two insights here that, that we take from this, this literature is that the retrieval um, of experiences in your memory database depends on how recent they are, so things you've seen most recently um, tend to be more likely to be recalled, but also the, the things that you've seen in the beginning, the very first word in the list, for example. Um, and then the second, so there's a U shape here. I come back to that. And the retrieval also depends on the similarity between the cue you're given and the experiences. So if I give you a cue about 10% inflation and, and, then, and you saw 10 and 3%, you're more likely to recall 10%. All right, so I'm going to show how this can be mapped into a model um, of inflation expectation, and I'm going to talk through some supporting evidence from U.S. inflation expectations data. Um, so the model is basically uh, an implementation of, of the work by Bordalo et al. in an inflation's context. So individuals selectively recall experiences from their memory database, give them a cue, and form their inflation expectations. And what is key is the similarity of experiences with acute hypothesis is going to determine your recall probability. So how do we compute that probability? Well, we compute that using our database of experiences, which is composed in this case of inflation rates that an individual of a certain age has experienced. So we set this to start at 16, but you know you can play around with this. And cues play an important role. So the cues that are relevant in the inflation context is, is the current inflation with some weight, um, as well as a range we are asked to consider with some other a complementary weight. And you know, this survey question is asking you about point expectations simply imply that this is a, uh, the whole real line for the, for the range. And if, if I ask you about a particular range and I come back to this, then we have some bounded interval. Um, and two features of the Q matter uh, for similarity with experiences in the database is the temporal context and the numerical value of the Q. So temporal context means basically you know, that some events are on top of your mind, but it can also uh, have occurred earlier and been rehearsed more, and also the sort of the salient, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the, the primacy that I showed you earlier. And then the numerical ma um, value matters because experiences uh, that are more similar to the Q are much easier to recall. Uh, and so we're going to obviously have to pick a, 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 a make some choices when you model things. So we're going to pick midpoints for specific ranges, and we associate. So the average inflation that comes to mind with uh, the real line as a normal value for, for, uh, for the whole range. Um, so the model uh, crucially uh, uh, has a function for similarity, which is exponentially decaying in the distance between 
particular experience, pi t minus s and the q that I just explained along a temporal and, and numerical context. So this shows you the, the function there. So this has three elements. Uh, the numerical similarity are the last two elements and the particular ex inflation uh, 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 rate is harder to recall, but it's very different from the Q. So we parameterize this quadratically here, um, as well as if it's very different from a sort of a normal value. Um, I know there's sort of slightly a, a temporal current inflation context, obviously, in the second term, we're given a current period inflation rate. Uh, and then also, um, the first term captures this primacy and recency that I showed you earlier from the lab experiments. Uh, which are captured by this inverse U-shaped distance parameterization um, um, for, for, this, uh, for this function here. And so then under the setup, right, your subjective recall probability is proportional to this negative of uh, uh, the exponential of the negative distance. So in particular, when you write this out, like more frequent experiences obviously are more likely to be recalled statistically, but crucially, uh, this, I wanna emphasize this experience effect is not mechanical you tend to uh, overweight similar low distance inflation experiences with the present uh, Q and underweight these dissimilar high distance uh, experiences. So this, this really means that possibly long forgotten or some somewhat forgotten experiences can suddenly be, be recalled very sharply. So this is the state dependent element in, in the, that comes from this, uh, this model set. Um, so then the subjective probability of a particular range is simply the sum of all these recall probabilities for all these relevant experiences that you have in your database. And the uh, uh, focus here of, of what we're doing is obviously thinking about point expectations is then simply the product of these recall probabilities times these um, pi t minus s that, that, that you have in your database. So really recall and beliefs are state dependent here Why? because of the cues you're given. And I think another interesting implication here is that the point expectations are not necessarily the same as aggregated beliefs when you ask about very specific ranges because then the cues might have a very different effect on, on how you recall uh, these individual ranges and you might attach very different probabilities. I'm gonna come back to that um, in the empirical analysis. Uh, so before I do that, I wanna present through the three testable uh, propositions based on, on this model. First about and foremost about point expectations and. I'll touch briefly on uh, propositions that, are, that allow us to test uh, 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 inflation, uh, uh, hypotheses about particular inflation events, as well as sort of the relationship between point estimates and ranges. So the f first proposition basically says um, that, you know, if you linearly approximate uh, respondents' point, point inflation expectations around, um, you know, a state of, you know, no similarity and no temporal context, you get this expression which uh, contains three, ter or three sets of terms. So the first one is really, um, the simplest one to understand, which is basically that higher inflation during your lifetime, this pi bar t minus one, maps into higher inflation expectations. Uh, and then the second line contains a set of terms um, weighting experiences according to the date when they occurred, which is encoding, encoded in these uh, beta one and beta two parameters. And that entails obviously the possibility for both primacy and recency uh, playing a role depending on the exact weights you choose. Um, and notably recency uh, is gonna enhance reactivity mechanically, right? If you have high inflation, especially you're gonna have high inflation expectation. And primacy on the con uh, by contrast is going to induce a, a lot of rigidity here. And then third, the, the new element um, is given by the third set uh, of terms uh, and that's a state dependent element in the formation of your expectations. So assuming sigma is positive here obviously, uh, implying that sharp belief changes are possible because of this numerical similarity to the Q that you're given, um, even if your database is very slow moving. And uh, um, the second proposition that we have relates to very specific inflation events. Um, you know, for example, uh, thinking about a uh, uh, high inflation range, inflation might be eight to 12% next year. Uh, so here, to think about this, we assume that individuals 
think about the, the range midpoints pi j as well as uh, the q's now being pi j and then sort of the aggregate uh, inflation that they observe. Uh, so there's a lot of terms here, but let me walk you through because the intuition is essentially the same as the previous um, proposition. So again, doing a, a linear approximation now of, of the odds of a, the, you know, given by the probability of a particular uh, um, range versus some base range here are uh, given by, again, three sets of terms, this one, then the ones with the beta one and beta two, and then this one. And you know, if you remember the other proposition, you can probably see a similarity here. Uh, no wordplay intended. So, um, and basically what this says is that your odds for um, a recalling a particular probability or a, a, a range pi j increase in the frequency Again, temporal context and similarity, but now in relative terms. And you know, this, this, is, this is sort of the same intuition. Now what's sort of new here is that these effects are um, amplified because um, the relative frequency of um, having experienced a particular range versus a base range is multiplying the, the temporal context effect as well as the similarity effect. And so what is the intuition here? Well, if inflation increases from two to 10%, the probability of this 10% range that you asked to think about should always go up, but it does so particularly uh, if you have lived through a lot of 10% inflation periods. So that's this ratio Nj over N, Nb. And uh, the last testable proposition I, I put forward is, uh, uh, relating point estimates to ranges. So often surveys elicit inflation expectation as point estimates, but also uh, as forecast densities over these particular bins or ranges. So our model can say something about this. In particular, according to the model, uh, memory-based point expectations are given, this comes out very naturally from the model, as a weighted sum of range expected values. So this guy, here times some weights. So where these weights for a particular range are basically the ratio between the probability estimate for that range that you have to have in mind uh, versus the one that you report. And in rational models, you know, there should be some internal consistency that weight should be one. But that, must, that is not necessarily true uh, if you have selective memory, right, because the Q might make you think, uh, report something differently than what, what, what you would do otherwise. Um, so that leads us to this proposition, and I sort of skipped the, the description, um, but essentially what you can show is that <coughs> the point estimate uh, that you elicit for inflation uh, <coughs> expectations is equal to the density-based expectations plus some other term, and that term, <coughs> can be positive, assuming again the sigma is, is positive, uh, and so that the point expectations exceed the density-based forecast, um, depending on the similarity between these different bins and the distance um, of that bin from sort of the average distance here. So if you have high inflation ranges and they tend to be more similar, so low distance compared to the average inflation, then you're gonna uh, over overweight these, these high, high inflation bins, and they're gonna get a, a, a higher uh, aggregate estimate. And obviously this has in, in some implications for survey design, how you're gonna queue people, um, question, setting up questions, et cetera, and, um, because these queues mediate exactly how you report in these experiences by um, recalling probabilities differently. So in the last few minutes, uh, let me talk about data uh, and uh, our empirical results. So we use data from two surveys, the Michigan survey and the New York Fed survey. So the MSC and the SCE, this is monthly data. We start in 78 from the Michigan survey, so for various reasons. Um, and we also use the SCE from 2013 to 2022. Those are rotating panels, people have talked about it. We use two types of um, expectations data here, the point ex estimations from both data sets and the, the forecast density from the SCE. So this is this obviously is great data. So um, the current and experienced realized inflation come from the Schiller database. Like I said, we start at age 16, but it doesn't matter so much. Um, we measure inflation 
experiences the quality frequencies and the business cycle in mind. Um, we have a current queue, the annualized quarterly inflation rates, um, and as complementary data to think about sort of the importance of aggregate signals, we also use CPI inflation forecasts from the survey of professional forecasters. Okay, so let me go quickly through the results. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about point ex ex expectations that corresponds to the first proposition. Um, and uh, basically, I'll show you what, what, what's here, but basically what emerges here is that strong, there's strong evidence for these three leading memory effects. So there is this baseline effect, uh, which is saying that you know, your past experience inflation is positively rated to your inflation expectation. So that's not, that may, it's been found in, in many, many contexts. Then there is um, a U-shaped uh, temp temporal uh, context, right? So there's recency and primacy, uh, which then becomes significant uh, in, in, the, in the last three columns. And then we also find evidence um, in, uh, for in this, the lines four and five for this, this uh, you know, state-dependent element in inflation expectations formation. And this is robust across, you know, including SPF forecasts and, and year effects. The same also holds when we run the same regression on, on using the SCE data. Um, and the only difference is that now, but this is, this is purely coincidental, right, that the, um, the U-shaped temporal context is, is significant when you include it immediately. Um, now, how important are these coefficients, right? Um, so we simply multiply them with the standard deviation of the explanators, and you sort of that, uh, see in the first column that the new terms, so the four line, rows four and five, which relate to the selective recall mechanism, come out quantitatively to be you know, in the same magnitude as, as the, the other effects. And the same holds for the MSC data. Um, now, looking at the medium horizon, it's interesting, right, especially for policymakers, so this is in the, in, in the two, three years ahead. And an interesting thinking about tar inflation targets and, and what our beliefs about the long-term inflation uh, um, really, how, how they determined. And the, the, that's interesting because while we find that the same fact, m model mechanisms are at work, the one key difference here is that the similarity with the experienced mean inflation rate now tends to be more important. So which makes logical sense if you think about it. Uh, but it also does mean that different cohorts think very potentially different ab about sort of medium term inflation expectations. Okay, so I'm out of time, maybe I can have a few minutes. Now we find, and I skipped this part here, we find support from uh, thinking about the specific inflation events that, you know, the, that the New York Fed survey has beautifully recorded because this adds also this cross-sectional dimension for an individual. Uh, essentially, we get basically the same three mechanisms to be at work. Uh, so there's really not, not much difference. And then finally, we can also think about this internal consistency between point estimates and the different uh, buckets of the forecast density. Uh, and there you see that essentially, if you look at the third column, the point estimate it says about a statistically insignificantly different coefficient of one when we have all the controls in there from the density-based forecast. So that sort of means that people are somewhat consistent. Um, um, but then also consistently not quite fully there in line with the model because um, point expectations are overweighted when they fall in uh, you know, um, more familiar ranges. So you know, they're more similar to average inflation experiences. So this, this is what's captured here by the second coefficient. Okay, um, now my last two slides are about um, thinking about this selective uh, recall, uh, the state dependence as mattering for the, the, the bigger picture. And here, I, and I'm gonna show you this in a similar slide in, uh, in a second. So here I'm showing you in this panel for different cohorts, um, basically the fully estimated model, the actual data, and the version of the model where we set the coefficient on selective recall to zero, so that's what we call the, the temporal part, that's the orange line, and you can see, first of all, two things. You can see that expectations are not rigid or overreacting, they're anchored when inflation is stable, but that they change when something happens with inflation, so that's not su surprising. But you do need similarity to get from a purely temporal context model to the actual data. So, 
so this, this state dependent uh, recall has, has, I think, has a role to play. Um, now we can also take the estimated equation that we have and then go to the Michigan data, which extends um, beyond what's available from the New York Fed data because there's a, a lag in the release, so we can't do it there. Um, and take, um, you know, and do a, a, an out of sample now casting exercise where we feed in the observed inflation rate um, and then generate the expectations and see how much they match up with the, the ones that are then reported officially. Uh, so, and we can do this for the full model and we can again also here show the importance of adding the state dependence to, uh, to this tem purely temporal context prediction. And one, one second, sorry. And then you see essentially that the full model and the data align very well if you include the selective recall, both going up but importantly also coming down. So we're not using any data to get the coefficients here that, that generates this now cast while um, you know, this um, temporal context does the same thing. It also is important, it works very well, but uh, you need some extra element to get this really sharp movement. Okay, and I think uh, I, I, I stop here because I'm over time. Thank you very much. So, questions? Yes, please. Michael Weber, Chicago. Very interesting and uh, a novel, definitely. I was just wondering how you think about two aspects. On the one hand, so like when you ask people what they think inflation is, they oftentimes have this upward bias. So like if I think inflation is 10%, but you objectively now measure things as if it was in reality as it is 6%. So like there's a little bit of this gap of like, uh, you know, how to think about similarity then, I think. And the second part is this relates to some of this recent work by Becker et al. that I would think is like, maybe call it, I don't know, Bin's illusion, in the sense that they show through survey experiments that if you kind of like shift the support of the bin, this shifts systematically, reported and uh, measured expectations. The same uh, is true if you blow up the width of the bins and stuff like, so like, you know, th the way you define bins seems to matter for like, you know, uh, what you get out of it and how you think about that in the context of your memory model. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, George Top, New York Fed. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on what Michael just said. Um, so this gap between perceptions and actual inflation is not stable, it's not fixed over time. So in the SCE, we actually find that um, in the run-up of inflation from 2021 to 2022, actually uh, perceptions of inflation over that period were lower than actual inflation. And then subsequently, over the period when inflation declined, then perceptions were higher than realized inflation. So actually, there seems to be some sort of inertia or stickiness in, in perceptions of inflation, and, and it really depends on what, infla what actual inflation is doing, whether it's rising or falling. Thanks. Yes, please. In the out of sample, very interesting paper, by the way. Uh, in the out of sample uh, forecast you do, um, I assume that the SPF forecast, you're, you're, you're taking that out. But I, I was I was just wondering, you know, when in in your estimates, that uh, the SPF forecast had a strong effect. It looked like, or, although you know the coefficient is very strong, very significant. But I don't know how much of explanatory power it has in in fitting the data. But going in in when you project out, you is that is do you neutralize that or 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 if you include that, do you see a steeper decline? Okay, should I yeah. try to answer? Yes. Um, so just thanks for the very good questions. Um, and, um, let me maybe just start with, with the last one. Um, so yeah, I was, was a little bit rushed. So actually in this case, we do have the SPF in. If you take it out, the nowcast actually fits better, but I haven't systematically explored that. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the short answer. So, and, uh, but I think there's, 
there's a lot you can you can actually you can do with this. I think actually for central banks it might very, be very interesting to see if you get inflation readings possibly on a high frequency basis like daily. You can you can get daily aggregate inflation expectations from from this, and uh, uh, you have a, a sort of the whole distribution of people's uh, memories that that yeah, that that, that's the, that has a lot of information. Um, the SPF does help obviously, and we know we know there's some aggregate signal, um, but in, in this case it. I, you know, it, it looked it looked it looked better from, from one time we omitted it. Uh, um, so this, this is a good question to follow up. And then I think I, I put Giorgio's and, and Michael's questions together because I, I think I'm out of time. Um, I think it's uh, this gap is really interesting to understand. And, and I, I, I think Michael and I, we actually have a paper we think in a different context about aggregation. Um, uh, I think um, what we're trying to emphasize is is more the the co-movement in a given point in time between what you, the, the selective recall uh, that's, that's triggered um, and the similarity to so this sort of new state dependent element. Um, this, there's a systematic gap actually that, that shows up. So I think that's worth studying a, um, a lot more. And I, I think you guys have created great data to do that, both with the cross-section of the forecast density and, and the aggregate uh, time series. Um, and I, I think both of your points are actually also um, uh, related to the, or say that you know the the actual cue does matter a lot. How how this how this uh, how how we recall this in a state dependent fashion. Um, so I think that that's totally also in line with different this ways you you ask the question. In fact, I think that's sort of what I'm also trying to say um, that it does matter precisely how you set up. Your, your questions and and the different bins and how you how you cue people in, in general because you are going to get different probability um, subjective probabilities and that's going to give you a, a different aggregate estimate but I think there's lots of open questions to study here so I think uh, we just try to throw out this this idea to the extent that bins matter you know, how you pick the bins. I mean, your overall results look like they correspond very closely and that the gap is actually quite small. So it doesn't seem to affect the density mean. It, there, is, there is exactly this very highly high correlation and, and then this other term is there. If you sort of make it quantitative, you can do the same exercise I didn't show, like you take the standard deviation it is on a similar magnitude, but it's not a, 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 as big as the other ones. So, so again, I think um, there's something that people obviously do in their minds, and they're not perfectly consistent. But it seems you, you created some good data. So, any other questions? If not, uh, um, join me to appreciate for appreciation club. <laughs> and, uh,